we can make the point that you did awfully well. You did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially nice was we actually went through the vineyard in uh, Tournon, which that's Hermitage, um, and they were already harvesting the white grapes. So to see that action going on in that context was great. Oh, gotta get, get you already. Yeah. yeah. Is it on and hot? Yes. Okay. Yeah, good, good trip, very restful, and got to see great stuff. And for those who don't know, I was in France for a couple of weeks celebrating my 40th wedding anniversary with my lovely bride, and we just had a blast. All right, let's get this going. Oops. Good morning. It's a problem, you know, when you, when you don't preach, like, for some weeks, then, then you talk too long, right? Because you've got all this stuff to say. That's, so the fact that we're starting late this morning is entirely my fault, my most grievous fault. But let's see what's going on here. I love technology. Say again? I did. I did. No, I mean, I thought about all of you. I wished you were there and could enjoy the things that we enjoyed. And so if you want to travel with me, next year we're going to, uh, to Greece uh, doing kind of antiquities and the steps of St. Paul. Uh, so that'll be, uh, we depart June the 
fifth? I gotta look. I don't remember. So it's middle of June. Do you know the dates? You're going. I don't remember. Okay, all right. I should know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's, is it in there? Oh, yeah, I suppose it is. I suppose it is. All right. So, according to the vicar, you had finished the first commandment. That's about, about a whole lesson short of where he should have gotten. So, I'll blame him. I won't blame you guys. Well, that's what he said. So, um, I, you know. Yeah, that's okay. Did he? Did he? Good. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you did that. You don't have to do that for me. I've, I've had a little experience. All right. So let's go ahead and pray and then we can start. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you set your word upon our hearts and lips that we may know your name and proclaim it in the world and receive the blessings and abundant gifts that come from the sharing, the confession of that name. Uh, allow us to receive your word this day that we may be strengthened in it and together with the Holy Church, uh, confess your name. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Okay, so second commandment, um, which is, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Uh, Luther's children's explanation, we should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, liar, deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. Um, so to begin with, we have to understand that in a biblical pattern of thought, God's name and his person are inseparable. Um, in our world, we're, if you know anything about philosophy, we're nominalists. That is, that names and things aren't coterminous with each other. We say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's false. Utterly and absolutely false. I'd rather you beat me than call me wicked names. Right? Because a name attacks my person. Um, maybe the best way to think about it is if I... Uh, took down an American flag and did the Mexican hat dance on it. Would that be a good thing? No, because it's an attack on the country to treat the flag that way. It's really true of any country's flag, quite frankly. Um, you would never mistreat a flag because the flag represents the country and you, you have to respect your country. In the case of God, it's even a tighter relationship to misuse God's name is to misuse God himself. Okay? So God's name reveals who God is. You get this right away in Exodus. Remember, Moses is called by God from the burning bush. He's amazed that he sees this bush that's a fire, but not burning up. How does this work? So he approaches, and of course he hears the voice of God. What does God say? I am who I am. That's God's name. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Uh, the Hebrew word here is Yahweh, uh, is I am who I am. So the great I am. So any place you see, both Old and New Testament, where, the, where the, the noun and verb or the pronoun and verb, I am, go together, you go, oh. So, for example, in the Gospels, Jesus will say, I am the good shepherd. Now, in Greek, Greek's an inflected language, so he could say, Amy, and leave out ego, but he doesn't. He says, Ego, Amy, I am. And he intends that to tie him to the God who reveals himself in the Old Testament. He is the living embodiment of Yahweh uh, in the world. That is his claim when he says that. Um, so the Jesus of the New Testament is the I am of the old as well. Um, let's see here. So the second commandment forbids us to curse, that is to call down God's condemnation on others. Uh, we often do this, for example, like when we're working with our hammer and smash our thumb, we'll damn the hammer. 
Hammers don't go to hell. It's, it's not really productive to do this, right? Okay. Um, by swearing an oath carelessly. That fish was this big, I swear to God, right? This is what we say. It was 50 feet if it was, if it was 10 inches. Um, the practice of any supernatural art without the direct command of God. In other words, to say, for example, that I know what the future is. Oops. In whose hand is the future? God's. And so you're really making a claim, uh, misusing God's name, and ultimately, of course, you run into a first commandment problem. You've just ordained yourself God. And that's really dangerous, I'm here to say. Um, In Leviticus, uh, you have this, a man or a woman who is a medium or a wizard shall surely be put to death. So the Old Testament is very clear about the fact that acting in a way as though you have supernatural power when you do not, is quite dangerous. Again, it's, you're making the claim that you're God. You cannot use God's name this way. It also, and most importantly, I would say, forbids false teaching. So it's not, we don't have the privilege just to say whatever we want about God, because we should be delivering what what belongs to his name, that is, the right teaching. Uh, The Bible is extremely clear about the fact that right teaching results in salvation. Now, of course, in our culture, we don't think there's any such thing as religious truth. The problem with this view is the Bible doesn't think this. Jesus doesn't think this. Jesus really thinks that what he says is the truth, and it is the difference between eternal death and eternal life. Okay, um, you get this powerfully in Galatians chapter one. Uh, Paul says, "I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ." By the way, the distortion was that you had to do good works along with faith to get right with God. And, of course, you have to remember that lots of Christian churches teach this. Faith plus something makes you right with God. And Paul rejects this absolutely. And then you, if you look at 8 and 9, it's really flabbergasting, right? But even if we, that is Paul the Apostle, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, i.e. damned to hell. <laughs> right? And if you didn't get it the first time, every once in a while Paul is the hammer on the tack. This is one of those places. If you didn't get it the first time, if you're not listening, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And of course, this gospel is a law-free giftedness from God. It's not your merit. It's not your worth. You didn't do it. Jesus did it all. And as soon as someone says, for example, Jesus is really great, but now you have to do fill in the blank. That is when you're already misusing the name of God by teaching something that is false. All right. Um, Let me just pause there. Questions? I asked you lots of questions. What's wrong with me? What's that again? <laughs> All right. Well, how does that, how does that, with that statement, how does that, how do you preach the name of God for somebody like, you know, our friends, the, the Jews, oh, yeah. the Baptists, right, right. who believe that Christ only paid so much, right. and that you have to give it up? Right. Well, I mean, there's a no, there's lots of answers to that question, but, In my opinion, the best one is this. I'm told, I don't know this for sure, but I'm told that if you take a course in counterfeiting, that is to to be able to recognize a counterfeit bill, not make them, right? That that you can recognize counterfeit. You have a two-week course with alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, I think. Or the treasury. I guess it's the treasury, sorry. Um, Alcohol, something else. Um, So you have this, this class, two weeks, And during those two weeks, you never see a single counterfeit bill. 
you only see the legitimate bill. And people who have taken that course will recognize a counterfeit bill like that, right? So what we're doing as Christian preachers is being obedient to the word of God. I put myself under it. I'm not its master. It tells me what to teach. And I'll give you the genuine bill every time. And when someone comes along and says, oh, yes, Jesus is fine, but that's when you'll go, wait, there's something not right about that because you know what the legitimate gospel looks and sounds like. Okay? Does that, does that help? There's lots of, lots of other answers, but that's, in my opinion, one of the best. Sure. Like that one? Oh, three. Yeah. Uh, now, we've talked about already in the class the various ways in which the law is delivered in the Old Testament. Um, this would be a case where what is wrong remains wrong, but the penalty would be different because this penalty fits with the civil law of Israel. Right? Sometimes um, in the Old Testament, you, again, we've seen earlier in our class where you have um, law that's universal everywhere all the time. Sometimes you have what's purely civil law for the nation of Israel. Um, another one, um, which we'll come up against, is homosexuality in Israel was also punishable by death. Now, we would say homosexuality is a sin, but we would never uh, support the idea that it should be punished by death. Cause, so there's a difference between the penalty and the sin. So this is still a sin, but we would never apply that penalty to it. Because we're not the nation state of Israel anymore. We're the church, and that's a different thing. Okay? So is that where the separation is between the You asked for questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously the church doesn't have any kind of external authority. I can't make you believe this. I want you to believe it. I think the Word of God has the power to get you to believe it. But if you walk out of this room and say, you people are crazy, I can't stop you. I don't want to stop you, right? Um, so I don't have any kind of temporal authority, um, humorously, um, uh, Napoleon, when someone said, aren't you worried about the Pope? The, and Napoleon said, how many battalions does the Pope have? <laughs> right? He wasn't afraid of the Pope because the Pope didn't have any temporal authority. And that's really the case. We've got moral authority. We've got the preaching authority of Christ. But I don't have power over your body. Right? I don't have power over your body. Government has power over your body, for better and for worse, <laughs> you know, but, but I don't have that power. I only have the weak power, the most powerful power, of the preaching of the Word of God. Right? So you can walk away any time. And I, I wholly support your ability to walk away. That's called freedom of religion, freedom of religious practice, right? This is what we believe. Um, we think what we're teaching is right, and we're not going to give our teachers, me, any options about teaching it. But if I say, eh, I don't really believe this anymore, then I'll say so in public and resign my office. But what a real comfort for, for, for not having our salvation dependent in any way on us uh, is, is the, you know, this false teaching. Yeah. our best effort. Right. Absolutely correct. And, and that's the center of the Christian gospel, which, again, you've already talked about a little bit in this class, that uh, the gospel is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. 
That's the Christian gospel. Uh, the law, our problems, you know, our transgressions require that gospel. So this is the reason why. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. When my kids were teenagers, the deal with them was this. I'll put the garbage cans out. You will bring the garbage cans in. Um, one evening, I came back from a late church meeting, and lo and behold, the garbage cans were still on the street. Was I a happy dad? No, I was not a happy dad. And so I chased the girls outside to go bring in the garbage cans. Um, if I had gone into their, I mean, I think of especially my younger, if I had gone into her room and said, you didn't bring the garbage can in, that's okay, I'll forgive you. Uh, no, that wouldn't have worked out very well, right? So what you do is you apply the law. Here's your sin. Let's figure out how to fix this. But then all there is is I forgive. I, there's total mercy, right? So, but you have to have a transgression, right? This is the problem in our culture today. Nobody's wrong about everything, anything, right? And as soon as we say, you know, this is wrong, well, how dare you? Well, I don't dare, actually. This is God's business. He decides what's right and what's wrong. And, and if you're willing to say, together with all of us, I, a poor, miserable sinner, oh, now we're in the right spot because he has mercy on, not good people, Bible's not for good people. If you're a good person, skip the Bible, go home, read the New York Times, whatever. If you're a, if you're a sinner, this religion is for you. Right? God has mercy on sinners. And I'm one of them, and so are you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jesus also tells us that we are not to follow false prophets. So it's, it's obvious that Jesus thinks there are such things, right? He's warning you against them, right? Sometimes people say, oh, well, whatever anyone thinks about religion is just fine. Jesus doesn't think that. Again, you're welcome to think what you want, but you can't say Jesus thinks this, all right? So what does he say? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. What do sheep's clothing, what does sheep's clothing look like? Right. Absolutely right. The, how I'm dressed. Yeah, how I'm dressed. I am potentially the wolf in sheep's clothing. So you can't determine about truthful teaching on the basis of your eyes. You can only determine truthful teaching on the basis of your ears. Correct. Right? So let's look at this text. You will recognize them by their fruits. Now, you have to be clear about this. What is the fruit of a teacher? Okay. His teaching. Yeah, his teaching. Exactly. Uh, so our grapes gathered... By the way, this is one of the jokes in the New Testament, which nobody gets anymore because we heard it a thousand times, like knock-knock jokes with little kids, right? Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? The crowd goes k -k 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 when Jesus says this. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, that is correct teaching. A diseased tree bears bad fruit, that is false teaching. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So what happens to false teachers? They're condemned to hell. You have to recognize this. I stand up here and teach and I'm imperiling my eternal soul by doing so because I'm responsible for proclaiming the truth. And if I don't do it, I am going to be damned. You have to understand this. Pastors don't blab like this for their own entertainment. This is a life and death reality for somebody in my position. You've got to understand. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. In other words, what they actually teach. And then he goes on and says... Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So even they can call him Lord, but they're not necessarily in the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What is that will? That the proclamation of the gospel should be delivered correctly to God's people. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? The word prophesy here probably means more like preach, right? Not tell the future, but preach. 
Uh, did we not preach in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Notice, even using God's name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Whew. So uh, Jesus says that, that we should avoid false teachers, that we should listen to their fruits and find out whether or not they're teaching the divine truth. When they're not, we should turn away from them, avoid them, mark them, um, and get away. Uh, because not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is truthful. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going even to heaven. Okay? You can say it as a cloak of unrighteousness. All right? Let me pause that. Questions? You know, that's a great question. I, I wrote on a sticky note probably two months ago. I actually wonder if this wasn't a, a speech affectation of Judas. Yeah. I don't know how these things come to me. I wouldn't say poking fun. I'm, I'm not sure that's quite right. Um, but... Say again? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the other, this is, I mean, these words are so interesting. So in today's gospel lesson, when the guy complains about what the master of the vineyard has paid everybody else, the master of the vineyard says, friend, can I not be free and generous with what is mine? And the Greek word for friend there is hetaira. That Greek word is only used, I think, three other times in the New Testament. Once to refer to Judas, actually. What's significant about this? A hetaira in common Greek is a high-class prostitute. Because that's what it means at bottom, right? So, uh, you know, you would go out in the evening and say to your mother, I'm going to meet my friend. And, of course, she would not be very happy because she knew you were going to meet a courtesan, right? But you use this kind of tame term. I don't, do we have a tame term for prostitutes? I, I've never used it, of course, so I don't know. Worker. Courtesan, maybe. But no one says that, courtesan, today. Yeah, you have sex worker, which I think is ridiculous, right? <laughs> Um, escort. 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 That's a good one. So, hetaira, friend, would be very much like escort, which is putting, you know, lipstick on a pig, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Correct. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. How do you how do you how do they even just stand with themselves knowing that they're going down? Yeah. Well, I mean, they're terrified. I mean, what happens in churches, and it I know the feeling. I've had the feeling where you go, if I don't do something, this church is going to fail. And that something is always wrong. You know. The big problem in that statement is the word, right? Is God not the Lord of the church? Does he not care for his sheep? Does he not rightly shepherd them? Are they not the flock of his possession? They are. Yeah, he's the bridegroom. I'm the minister of the bridegroom. I get to serve the bridegroom. And so... Um, Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That that's a good way to put it. He's he's the groom, I'm the best man. I'm taking care of the bride for him until the day when bride and groom are brought together perfectly in the consummation of the kingdom. Or another way to look at it, he's the king, I'm the prime minister. 
What am I doing? I'm giving the king's gifts out to the citizens of his kingdom, right? So all those things are pictures in the Bible about the relationship between God, the pastors, and the church, right? All right. Second commandment encourages so our commandments all are thought of as having, that's a much younger me, uh, is exactly, um, the, the church is always, th- or the commandments are always thought of as having a positive point. So they do not only say, do not do this, but Luther will always explain them, but rather do this, right? What is it? Prayer, preaching, and praise of God. The psalmist says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Get on your knees and pray. God will deliver you. And when he does, you get on your knees again and glorify him. Uh, 2 Timothy 4. This is actually the motto of my alma mater, of which I'm actually the chairman of the Board of Regents. May God have mercy on both the seminary and me. (laughs) Preach the word. And this this verb preach, again, Greek is more clear than English. This word preach means preach continually, not just once. Keep on preaching the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. So, you know, if I have to say to you, your life is in disorder, I will do it patiently and with the word of God teaching you the right way. Okay? I have a question. As a pastor, is it your responsibility to go to other pastors when you pray for them or them no. for no. the wrong people? No. It is the responsibility of the rightly positioned authorities. So in our church body, we have overseers. I ha- There's a circuit visitor in our little community of churches, seven or eight churches, whatever it is. That circuit visitor is the authority over me. Over him is our district president, who is the bishop of our Texas district. Excuse me, Texas district. Um, I don't have the right to meddle in somebody else's sheepfold. I have my sheepfold. I meddle in it. <laughs> Not really. I serve it, right? I guide it and guard it. But I don't have the right to butt in. So, in fact, I got an email, maybe this is, what, three weeks ago from a lady in San Antonio. Um, You know, terrible things are happening in my congregation. Can't you do something about it? And the short answer is, no. I know who can, and I, I therefore encourage you to talk to the circuit visitor and call the district president, which hopefully she did. But I... If everybody's sort of butting in, it gets to be a real problem, right? So we don't want that to happen. Because, I mean, I literally don't know what's going on in San Antonio. I can take this woman's word for it, but as you know, no matter how flat the pancake, it always has two sides, right? So I just don't know. Um, Now, I would say I would never tolerate the intrusion here of any kind of incorrect teaching. That I'm going to step on because I know it's about life and death. It's not just about various opinions and so on. Yeah, but external to me, not my job. Now, I'm in a unique place because I'm also kind of a, I don't know what, I'm a vice president of our church body, which in function is basically an archbishop. So I'm a parish pastor. This is my parish but I also have authority from Beaumont to San Diego to the border of Canada, all of Colorado, Alaska, and Hawaii. It's a third of the land mass of the United States. Thank you. It's a bad job, but somebody's got to do it. Um, If the president of our church body, our, and you'll excuse the use of the term here, Pope, uh, uh, if our president comes to me and says, I need you to help me with a particular issue in Las Vegas, then I can go do it. But I cannot take that on myself. He's the authority that permits or would compel me even to to go into another situation that needs help. But till he does that, it is not my job. I've got problems enough here. I don't need to find problems elsewhere, right? That's not with you, of course, but 
What's that? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, never mind. I won't comment. Let's move on. <laughs> Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. That's the life of prayer, to tell God what God has already told us about himself. I mean, so prayer is really quite simple. And I didn't realize this maybe till I was in college. Uh, the man that taught me Greek, beginning Greek, was a wonderful, pious, faithful pastor. And he modeled using the word of God for prayer. And so during, at the beginning of Greek class, he would take the gospel lesson for the next Sunday and pray it. And it was like revelatory. Um, and I've never been able to do, as, do it as well as he's in heaven now, God bless him. Um, but, but this is what you want to do. Take what God has said, repeat it back to God. This is the best and most pious prayer. And that's why daily devotions are really prayer, right? You're reading the word of God for the purpose of setting it on your heart, on your lips, in your mind, so that you can share it, but also... By doing this, you're actually repeating it to God because he's there when you're going through the word of God because it's his word. He's speaking. You're never alone. All right. Let me pause there. Questions about the second commandment before we go to the third? Bueno, let's move on. What is the third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So what's the Sabbath day in the Old Testament? What day is it? Saturday. Correct, correct. And so the Old Testament obligates the people of the Old Testament to honor a day, that is Saturday, which went from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Remember, for the Jews, days are evening and morning the first day, right? So, so this is the way days go. What is the explanation for Luther? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. So notice the difference here for Luther that the, the, sec, the third commandment has as its focus um, the blessing of studying God's word and hearing preaching. That's what it's for. So how many days a week is this possible? Seven. Yeah, all seven. So what happens in the New Testament is the one great day of rest becomes the seven great days of rest. There's rest for the soul. What does Jesus say? Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's not just on Sabbath. That's every day. Um, interestingly, um, Jesus rises on Sunday. What day of the week is Sunday? Sort of. The church has always thought of Sunday as, to quote the Beatles, eight days a week. It's the eighth day. What does that mean? It's the day that never ends. Yeah, exactly. So this is why if you go look at the baptismal font in that building, it's set in an eight-sided case. And the glass bowl is also octagonal, eight-sided. Because what's happening in baptism is you're being put into the eighth day, the resurrected day, the day that's only, that only has life and peace. Um, so, so all of this uh, is kind of, uh, what would you say, uh, in the, the third commandment and its meaning. But it gets its full fruition when Jesus comes and brings perfect peace to his people, through his suffering and death and glorious resurrection. Okay? Sabbath means rest. Oh, my Hebrew got all messed up. Sorry. Shabbat is just the verb that means to rest in Hebrew, right? Um, so what God wants us to do is to find rest. And he doesn't mean just, you know, get your hammock, your pina colada, you know, like that. That's not what he's talking about. Right, God didn't say to the angels, all right, boys, it's the seventh day. Let's do the hammock and the pina colada and all that stuff. I'm going to stop doing any. What if God stopped doing anything, everything? What would happen then? Yeah, it, the whole universe would go like that, right? So the seventh day isn't absolute rest, but it's rest for the soul. It doesn't mean you don't work. 
it means that you're set in the right things, okay? Um, Gen uh, Exodus and Genesis, six days work shall be done. On the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. So again, at the end you get the temporal penalty, the penalty of the nation state of Israel, but it's still the truth that, uh, that there should be days of rest. Genesis 2, and on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. So notice that this isn't just something God imposes on us. It is something about God himself. And again, it isn't do-nothingness, right? I mean, that's the way we often take it, right? Oh, I get to put my feet up and have a beer. It's probably not what God means, right? I'm not, ag I'm not against you're putting your feet up and having beer. That's, don't get my, that's not wrong, you know. But, but, uh, but I think, you know, that the great rest is also the great work of worship, right? Because then we're confronted with the man who dies to bring peace to his people, right? And that's... There's a relationship there. On uh, Old Testament Sabbath pointed forward to the rest for the soul that Jesus would bring the church, which I've already mentioned. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This, by the way, is, is an image by, uh, not Durer, um, I'm drawing a blank. This will happen to you when you get my age, too. Um, I'll think of it. doesn't matter. So this is Luther preaching, and this is Mrs. Katie Luther here, and his children, and uh, several important people from Wittenberg. But notice, and, and by the way, there's no place in Germany that looks like this. This is purely fanciful. But the point is, what's he preaching? Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Right, right, exactly. And notice, you know, his job is to point out Christ crucified. It is their job to look upon Christ crucified in faith. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. Right. So this is a great question. The name that the angel gives the resurrected Jesus, this I find flabbergasting. Uh, you have come to find the crucified one. Now, what did they know about Jesus? They knew he was crucified. They watched it happen, right? They knew he was in the tomb and dead. The big issue was, is he raised? The angel does not call him the resurrected one. The angel calls him the crucified one. Why? Because the crucifixion of Jesus is the payment for all sin. The resurrection of Jesus is the proof that the payment has been taken by the Father and applied to all persons. And so throughout the New Testament, we hear of we, well, I'm quoting now Paul, 1 Corinthians 1, we preach Christ the crucified one. And so if there's no corpus up there, you've just said, yeah, we're not so sure about the crucified one. But we are sure. He is the one who has borne the sins of the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know if it was just the last week, but yeah. They just dedicated it. Yeah. The International Center is our big black office building in St. Louis, which we. this is where all the... Less important things happen for our church body. It's the organization. Cronach, there we go. Yeah. Cron is it the younger or is it the elder? Pro probably the elder. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lucas Cronach was a but. See, this is Lucas Cronach was a buddy of Luther's. And his workshop is just across from the Rat House in Wittenberg. So if you go to Wittenberg, you can go into Lucas Cronach's workshop. He's a very famous painter, did a lot of art. in, and, But they were buddies. They sat and drank beer together and complained about the Pope and did all kinds of great stuff together. So. Just, just 
Yeah, that could be. I mean, they were friends, so you'd think that Cronach could give a decent image of him. By the way, this is actually in the altarpiece at St. Mary's in Wittenberg. So it's a triptych. So you have like an upper center piece and then two pieces on the edges. And then at altar level, it's a piece about uh, what that deep and at least as wide as my wingspan right at the altar. And then the triptych is above it. Um, and of course, you know, seeing it in person is much better than this fuzzy, terrible looking image. Uh, all right. Colossians, this is the biggie, right? Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink. So there's no laws about what you can eat or drink. Remember the story of Peter who, who gets, you know, gets the, uh, the, the, the napkin coming down full of unclean animals and God says, kill and eat. And Peter says, oh God, I'm way too pious for that. And, and of course, God says, shut up and do what you're told. <laughs> Don't make unclean thing, don't make unclean those that I have said are clean. So suddenly all food, which of course drives Jews crazy, all food becomes clean. So don't let anybody uh, pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So um, the best way I know how to illustrate this, say you're on a long road trip and, you know, before the cell phone, you know, you say, well, we've been on the road 12 hours, time to stop. The kids see the, the sign on the side of the road, the billboard that says, Holiday Inn, you know, next uh, uh, exit on the right, one mile down the road. Hooray, Dad, there's the Holiday Inn, let's go there, they have a pool. So um, you stop the car immediately right there by the sign, get out and say, here's the Holiday Inn. Let's, let's, uh, let's put our bedrolls out here under the shadow of the sign. What will the kids say? Out of your brain. Yeah, out of your mind, right? Exactly. Because the sign points to something else. And that's what's important, not the sign itself. The sign points to something, right? Well, the Old Testament Sabbath pointed to Christ who says, I come to give you rest. He is the Sabbath of the New Testament. And that's why, again, for Christians, there's no rule about this or that day being required for satisfying God as a worship day. Um, so, for example, people will say, hey, pastor, do I have to go to church? And the answer is no. Louder? You get to. Right. Why? Because God's gifting you. And who says, eh, I don't like that. I don't want that gift. An unbeliever. That's who. Okay. Um, the best way to illustrate it is on Chris. Try this on Christmas with your children or grandchildren. <laughs> this is great. So, you know, they're all, our, our, our grandchildren, when, when they're with us, will open gifts on Christmas Day after services are over and lunch is had and so on. By then, of course, they're about to split with anticipation. But say this to them. Now, it's time to open the gifts. If you don't start immediately opening those gifts, I will punish you very severely. Your children are going to look at you and go, have you slipped a cog? You know, why? Because they are anticipating a gift. You don't have to make them open them. It's not a matter of law. It's a matter of giftedness. So what's happening on Sundays is God is giving himself and all of his gifts away. And you're saying, and eh, do I gotta? What? You... By saying that, you've just shown you have no idea what's happening in that building. Right? So, again, it's not a matter of must. It's a matter of privilege. And that's why the church has, at various times and places, had services not just on Sunday, but other days of the week. If your children are in our school, they're going to chapel Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Right? I don't think it hurts them at all. All right. Um, 
so God does set aside certain days to be, uh, it does require set, certain days to be set aside for corporate worship, but there's no law about which day it has to be. For example, if government started to say, you may not worship on Sunday, we would go, okay, we'll worship on Saturday. We have no problem with that. Who cares, right? We'll, we'll come and hear the word of God on Saturday. Um, what, what you get here, of course, is the earliest practice of the Christians. So it's very early in the book of Acts. What did they do? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, right? So you get number one, content, teaching. And the fellowship, which is the unity around the teaching. So you get those two get together, teaching and fellowship. Um, and notice there's an and there, teaching and fellowship. Then you get, uh, again, a preposition to the breaking of bread and prayer. So they get put together. But so preaching, prayer, Lord's Supper. The breaking of bread, by the way, is not potluck suppers. The Bible doesn't know potluck suppers. Right. Yeah, right. That, that's Texas Lutheranism knows brisket. But the, uh, the figure of speech, especially in anything written by Luke, breaking of bread is the sacrament of the altar or the Lord's Supper. Right. But this is exactly what happens in the Lutheran service on Sundays. Teaching, preaching, prayer, Lord's Supper. Right. So we're really doing the same things. And what did they do? They received their food with glad and generous hearts. So, I mean, they were glad at receiving it. They, they ended up, of course, having generous hearts. They supported one another in need and so on. So that was the practice of the early church. Hebrews 10, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting the meeting together as is the habit of some. So it's already a problem probably by the... I don't know, probably before 70 A.D. that some people are cutting church. Like, that's new, right? Uh, no, uh, as is the habit of some. But what? Encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day is the writer talking about? Nope. What day? Yeah, judgment day, right. But... That, that's extremely significant to the writer of the Hebrews because the writer of the Hebrews is writing to uh, a community that's about to undergo persecution. So he wants them to continue to worship together. How does a persecuted community end up being persecuted? The secret police stand at the door and arrest you on the way out. And yet the writer of the Hebrews says, still gather together, right? So uh, where it is, in fact, dangerous to do so, the church still encourages her children uh, to, to gather around the word of God, prayer, and the sacrament. Okay? And, I mean, now we've got freedom for now. Let me put it that way. For now, we have freedom of religious practice in our country. We're grateful for that. I don't know how long it's going to last. Um, our church body exists because the Prussian king tried to enforce a false religion on Lutherans in Germany. And our people said, nah, we're not on board with that. And they got on five ships and came, long story, to St. Louis. They lost one of those ships at sea, all hands lost. It cost them something to come here for religious freedom. We're practicing in keeping with their hope in that movement in the 1840s to come to the United States. God has not specified a particular day, but the church worships on Sunday. Why? Because it's the day of the resurrection of Christ. So even during Lent, how many days is Lent? Sort of. It's 47 days, really. It's 47 days long. It only consists of 40 days. The seven days are Sundays. So dur even during Lent, Sundays, there's a solemnity there, of course, because it's Lent. But even Sundays during Lent are still resurrection days, right? So they aren't quite as muted, say, as a worship service on a Monday during Lent would be, okay? So uh, 52 days of the year, we come back to the open tomb and think, there's my life. I have it. Christ has assured it to me. 
Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, of course, this is Jewish reckoning Sunday, when we were gathered together to break bread, that is to have the Lord's Supper, again, Luke uses this phrase, Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Of course, he he was so long-winded, uh, Eutychus fell out of the window and, and died, so I try to avoid that eventuality in my preaching. <laughs> it's just saying. That's why we don't have any windows. Yeah, that's right. Um, Sabbath rest then consists, consists in rest for the soul through the reception of the gifts which God has given to his church in Christ. Uh, what does Jesus say? Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That's what true rest is. God requires us to support a faithful church with our offerings of time, talent, and treasure. Second Corinthians, people say, the Bible doesn't say anything about money. Uh, wrong. The Bible certainly does. Uh, you have to, as I said, yeah, in, as I said in my sermon, you have to remember that Matthew is a tax collector. Right? And so it's funny, if you read Matthew's Gospel, economic terms are much more obvious in Matthew's Gospel than in Mark, Luke, and John. No big surprise. He's an accountant, right? Okay. Second Corinthians 9, Paul each one must give as he's made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. No one puts the gun to your head. This isn't like the synagogue where they say, here's your tithe, you have to pay this if you want to get into the holy days. That's not the game. For God loves a cheerful giver. Give it freely, give it cheerfully, not because you must be, because it is a joy and a pleasure. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all contentment in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And I'm old, so I've had a fair amount of experience, in my opinion, and I've heard, you know, I've heard older pastors say this when I was younger, you cannot outgive God. And I thought it was bosh. I'm just being truthful. How wrong I was. I cannot outgive God. It is amazing how generous he is uh, to us. And we lose track of that all too easily. Um, but finally, church life requires you. Um, we, we want you, not yours. We actually hear from people. I'm not joining your church because you just want my money. Uh-uh. We don't want your money. We want you. We want you to go to heaven. If you want to keep every single dime in your own hot little pocket, you do it. But we want you, right? Uh, we want you to share your faith with others whom you can make just as rich as you are. Right? That's the richness of the church, is the teaching. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of the story of St. Lawrence. Lawrence was a deacon of the church in Rome, and uh, he got called before the magistrate. The magistrate was interested in getting his hands on the big bucks of the church. This is in the second or third century. And so Lawrence says, look, it'll take me 24 hours to get the, the, uh, the riches of the church together. I'll come to the court early tomorrow morning and bring it all. The magistrate's going, oh, good. The next morning, Lawrence shows up in the Forum of Rome, and it's packed with people. Who are they? The poor. He goes into the court and says to the magistrate, here is the treasure of the church. The magistrate was not amused. Lawrence had a good sense of humor. The magistrate did not. And he had him fried on a gridiron. It is said, whether it's true or not, I don't know, that at some point, Lawrence said to his tur uh, torturers, turn me over, I'm done on this side. But he was tortured to death by being uh, toasted on a gridiron for his good sense of humor and his unwillingness uh, to hand over anything but the true treasure of the church, her people. Uh, we need you to serve in church and school. Uh, we have a combined uh, budget well in excess now of $3 million a year. Um, your support makes it possible to do the things we do. A great, great chunk of that is, of course, tuition. We do have to charge tuition to keep the school going. 
But as those of you who have children in our school recognize, we're not charging the tuition that many uh, private schools are charging. We're not interested in making money here. This isn't what the game is. We want your children to be properly educated, and we're willing to make that sacrifice so that it can happen. Um, so we certainly, you know, we, we never want to price ourselves according to the market in the neighborhood because we want you to have the best possible education for your children at a price that's reasonable. But it does take money to run the joint, sorry. Um, and, uh, and so we do, we do have to make those requests for financial support, as well as, again, more importantly, your personal prayerful support of the life of the church in sharing your faith and supporting uh, the faith of your fellow believers together in one community. So that's the end of the first table of the law. Uh, we'll take up next week with the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Uh, which is the basis of all obedience in the second table of the law. Uh, let me just pause there if you've got questions before we pray. Thank you. Yeah. We don't just need your mother. Yeah. yeah. We need you. Yeah. Right. And Paul will say precisely this. We don't want yours. We want you. That's in Second Corinthians as well. Okay. Further? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for how generous you've been to us, granting us every gift and blessing. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us to find ourselves desirous of these gifts with our whole heart and soul by the power of your Spirit, that we may always seek them, receive them, and be blessed by them. Help us to share the faith that you've granted to us, that others might know the great joy that you've granted us, all this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week.